Our gospel reading for today is a story of healing. We see Jesus heal two people. Now, while healing is indeed the focus of the story, that's not going to be the entire focus of what we're going to talk about today. However, it's, it's not right to just simply gloss over the healings. I want to acknowledge the stories of healing in the Bible are difficult. While they're beautiful, they're instructive, these healing stories just leave us with so many questions. It's tempting to see the healing stories as puzzles to be deciphered and figured out. Why were the people healed? How was their faith involved in their healing? Did they ask in a, in a certain way? How long did they have to suffer before they were healed? All of these are valid questions. But all of these are questions without answers. We could perhaps construct you know, some sort of formula for healing based on the two healings we see here today in Mark. Would not be easy, as healings are noticeably different. Even in this one story, they're different. And if we consider all the other healings in the gospel, we'd have to throw out our formula and try again. None of these, this is very satisfying to people trying to figure out how the New Testament worked. The lack of formula, the lack of answers to questions are very unsatisfying to people today, including probably people in this room. People pray, people lament, people cry out in suffering, asking God, loving God for healing. While this does not solve the healing puzzle. We are called to pray for healing for ourselves, for others, and for groups. And we are also called to love and trust in the grace of our loving God. I can you offer no assurance of any healing miracle. No one else can guarantee a miracle either. Yeah, there's some people who offer you a formula, a set of steps, and say that if you follow these steps and do this formula, then you're going to get healed. As long as you have the right faith, pray the right prayers, do the right thing. And if you're not healed, well, then you must have done something wrong. This is not the way of God. This is not the way of Christ. This is not even the way of our faith tradition. Whether we like it or not, healing is done by God in ways that we cannot understand. Miracles happen. We can't predict them. All we can do is keep praying, keep hoping, keep trusting. We always have the holy, gracious mercy of God to hold on to. And while there is no guarantee of miracles, we can be assured that God walks with us through this sin-caused pain and suffering of this life, pulling us along into salvation. Let's turn to the text. Mark starts a story, and he often starts a story, then starts another story, finishes it, and then comes back to finish the first story. Mark could have told the first story completely, then moved on to the second story, not what Mark does. He embeds one story in another one to make the picture bigger, to make us understand maybe just a little bit more. Our story, the first one, starts today with Jesus getting out of a boat and being met by the crowds of people. Now, what we didn't hear in our readings this year is... This was Jesus coming back over the lake from healing the demoniac on the other side in the Gentile area, which is an amazing story. But we don't get it this year. We're back after the healing. And as Jesus is getting out of the boat, he's met by Jairus. Jairus is the leader of the synagogue. He is a person of power and influence in the community. And he's got this religious and political position, as he sees Jesus, he falls on his face in front of him. And he asks Jesus, he begs Jesus to come and heal his daughter. 
because his daughter is dying. Jairus displayed faith and trust in Jesus. We're not told by Mark if how Jairus learned about Jesus. We don't know if Jairus was simply desperate. Maybe both were at play. Jesus responded to Jairus' plea and went with him to where his daughter was. Now, at this point in the Jairus story, Mark just breaks in with another story and then returns back later on to the Jairus story. Okay? Now, there is a fancy literary term for this. It's called intercalation. Okay? But there's a better term. Okay? There's one that you might actually remember. Okay? The other term for this is more fun and easier to remember. This is also called a Markin sandwich. Okay? Start here at the bread, go into the meat area, and then we're going to go back to the bread later. Okay? Now, Mark could have completed the whole Jairus story, then told the other one. That's not what he does. So Mark is continuing on. He's explaining that Jesus is on the way to Jairus' daughter, and there are people everywhere. The crowd is thick. There are people uh, crowding in on Jesus. Now, most of us have been in a situation where, you know, the crowd just seems to be insanely large and closing in. Uh, usually after some sort of sporting event or maybe a concert. Uh, you might be able to see some of this effect happening if you're in the right or wrong place during the 4th of July parade this week as the crowds come in. Uh, I can remember one time almost 30 years ago where, I, you know, my brother and I were uh, leaving a, a Motley Crue concert trying to get to the motorcycle parking area, and I thought we were going to die. There were just so many people closed in on one area. So after a brief description of the crowd, Mark introduces us to the next person in the healing stories. Now this person has no name. No name. We never learn her name. We learn a few things about her. First of all, that she has been bleeding for 12 years. Now, what are we to make of this unnamed woman with this situation? What does this woman represent? What is the history and situation of this woman who will become famous in the Christian church for having faith, even though we don't even know her name? To start with the obvious, she's a woman. Women are second-class citizens in a society centered on men. Secondly, she is suffering from bleeding and is therefore ritually unclean. Jewish society had rules around women who were experiencing their period and other rules about women who had bleeding. The basis of these rules was separation from the community. Now, an example of these rules regarding, and this one's just regarding menstruation, was uh, illustrated in Rachel Held Evans' book, A Year of Biblical Womanhood, where she took some of the rules in the Old Testament and lived them quite literally. Okay? So she explains that based on the Old Testament rules, uh, during her period, she had to live in a tent in the backyard. Her husband lived in the house, but she had to live in a tent in the backyard. It's, it's a great book. You, you read it. Some of the things are pretty awesome. Uh, but those are some examples of the separation that was asked for by these laws. Now, Mark does not explain the extent of the isolation this woman had in her community. We don't know if she was just fully ostracized and everyone kept their distance from her, or if she had a group of people that maybe could support her, we don't know. But we do know that she definitely suffered from stigma in this community because she was ritually unclean. We can be assured that she suffered from not only physical pain, but social stigma. And the healing she's about to receive was not only physical, it was social, 
It was emotional and it was spiritual. The woman knew that Jesus was the source of healing. However, she was afraid to approach Jesus because legally she couldn't. Okay? Um, she did probably not view herself worthy of doing what Jairus did. You see, Jairus went up to Jesus, fell down in humility. This woman did not even believe she could do that. What she did think she could do is, oh, if only I can get close to this healing power. And that's what she did. She got close enough to touch the edge of his clothing. The edge of his clothing. And as soon as this, well, so that's how she started her healing. Now, we also learn that this woman had spent all of her money before this situation. She had this bleeding and she went to medical experts to try and figure out how could they help her and she got no results. Now, here is something that is a, a problem that is 2,000 years old, but yet it is a problem that still plagues our society today. Many of us know people who have had medical problems and have had to go into bankruptcy because of them. This is what happened to this woman some 2,000 years ago. But she touched the healing power of Jesus by touching his cloak. And here is some very interesting and brilliant and beautiful writing about Jesus. About Jesus being a fully human, incarnate being, and also divine. Because Jesus' response was, what happened? So, full of the grace and healing power of the Holy Spirit... He knew that that grace and power of the Holy Spirit left him and did some work, did some important work, but he did not know who it was. Wow. Human enough to not know who had the power, but divine to know that that power had left. So Jesus looks around and asks his disciples, who touched me? And his disciples are going, what are you talking about? Do you see all these people that are around here? How can you ask such a question? Who touched you? But Jesus still looked around. Now, the woman, realizing that she could no longer remain in secret, came to Jesus in fear and trembling, not knowing what was going to happen? She knew something happened, but what would Jesus do? So like Jairus, like the powerful person from the synagogue, she fell down at Jesus' feet and told Jesus her story. Told Jesus her story. What had happened to her? And Jesus told her, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Because now you are healed from this pain, this physical condition, and you are also restored to community. That is some amazing healing. Now, as we close today, after this story of healing, we also have another story of healing that I, I want to talk about. So I want you to put yourself in the place of Jairus. Because at this point, Jairus was coming along with Jesus. And his daughter is dying. And in fact, as the woman is telling the end of her story and Jesus is telling her to go in peace, a crowd comes and tells her, now your daughter is dead. Can you imagine the emotions that went through this synagogue leader? who thought, why is this happening to me? You know, perhaps he thought, I have done what I have been asked to do. I am the leader of the synagogue. I've tried my best. 
The healer is right here. I thought God was providing for me, and now my daughter is dead? Or did Jairus see the miracle that happened to this woman and have his faith strengthened to know that Jesus is who he says he is? We don't know. And I would imagine both happened inside his brain at that moment. That both the doubt and the faith started wrestling with each other, and that is how he continued on. And maybe that's a lesson for us, is that the doubt and the faith will continue to wrestle in us, yet we know that Jesus is going to be there with us, that God is going to take us along the way. God commended both of these people of their faith. But even in Mark's story, we see where the doubt creeps in. Even with the woman with the strong faith who was healed of her hemorrhaging, after she had been found out by Jesus, she was afraid of what was going to happen. Doubting the goodness of maybe herself. And Jairus, we don't know how he felt as he was going on this path. But as followers of Jesus, we know that miracles exist, but we don't know how they happen. We are simply called to live in that mystery. We are called to work with whatever faith we have, be it the size of those little mustard seeds we've heard about, or as big as those mountains, and maybe that happens both to us on the same day. We are to work with that faith because that's what Jesus is working with. That's the faith that God is working with. God can take our faith and do amazing things with it. And even when life is pushing back on us, we know that God is there with us and understands. Amen.